So I'm Khaled El Imam. I'll be uh, hosting today's webinar and I'll also be presenting later on. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'll introduce myself and then I'll introduce my, my co-presenters in a moment. So um, I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa and uh, I run a health informatics research lab at the Children's Hospital uh, of Eastern Ontario in, in Ottawa. And I also uh, the co-founder and CEO of Replica Analytics company that develops data synthesis technology. Um, so the session today uh, is expected to last an hour and we'll, we'll make sure that we end on time. Uh, we will send you a copy of the slide deck to, to all of the attendees after the webinar. And we're also recording the session and we'll be putting the recording on our YouTube channel in the next day or so. Um, at the end, we'll uh, leave some time for questions. So please think of your questions as we are presenting and then enter them through the, the chat. I will then ask one of the presenters or more than one at the end to answer each question until we run out of time. Um, all of the attendees are muted and therefore uh, the only opportunity you will get to ask questions will be through, uh, through the chat. Um, so our two presenters, in addition to myself today, are Janice Branson, who's the Global Head of Advanced Methodology and Data Science in Clinical Development and Analytics at Novartis in Basel in Switzerland, and Nathan Good, Principal at Good Research, which is a data security and privacy consulting company based in California, and he also teaches at Berkeley. Um, the handouts that we will send out will have full bios and uh, contact details for, for all the speakers and presenters, so, so you can reach out to them afterwards if you have any uh, questions. Uh, that come up during the session and that we don't have time to uh, to answer. Um, so this is our agenda. I'll uh, give a very brief introduction, uh, providing an overview of the topic to situate it in the broader context. Um, and then Janice will provide an or, uh, her presentation, providing the business context for doing these empirical assessments of privacy risks, which are, um, uh, essentially re-identification attacks, um, and then I'll describe methodology, and then Nathan will describe experiences uh, doing these types of, uh, of empirical assessments, and then we'll close off with, uh, with Q&A. And these times are all Eastern, uh, Eastern time, so times may be different where, wherever you're located. So let me start off by just talking a little bit about uh, depersonalized data. Um, so depersonalized data can be used for secondary purposes such as analytics and machine learning. There are different techniques that can be used for depersonalization and each can achieve different degrees of protection. So these include things like the identification, pseudonymization, and data synthesis. Uh, once data is depersonalized, you need to be able to evaluate how effective that depersonalization process has been. So this is done by matching the records in the depersonalized data with real people in the population. And of course, you'd want there to be very few correct matches. So there are two general ways for performing this kind of matching. The first is using statistical models that estimate the probability of successfully matching a record to a real person. There are many ways to do this. Many models have been developed with different strengths and weaknesses. The second approach is empirical, where you actually try to match the records in your data set with real people using other information and knowledge about these people. Uh, for example, um, you can try to match the records with famous people, and so you use information and knowledge about famous people to do that matching. This empirical process is sometimes called a re-identification attack or identification attack or a de-anonymization attack or a motivated intruder test. So for the purposes of our webinar today, we'll call this a motivated intruder uh, test or a motivated intruder attack. So in practice, motivated intruder tests have been done in two different ways. First, by individuals um, on other people's data. So this has often been done by academics attempting to match depersonalized records to real people and then publishing the results. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on. And the second type is when the data controllers themselves commission motivated intruder tests on data that they have depersonalized themselves. This is then an empirical evaluation of how well the depersonalization process works so how well the, the identification, the systemization, the data synthesis process works, um, and it's complementary to the statistical approach that I mentioned earlier on as another way of evaluating um, matching risks. Um, 
We have also uh, we have done a number of these motivated intruder tests ourselves, and we just recently published a paper describing a study with clinical trial documents, and we'll send you a link to that study uh, with the materials from this uh, webinar as well. Okay. So the rest of the webinar is divided into three sections. As mentioned earlier, in the first section, Janice Branson will describe the motivations for performing a motivated intruder test for a global pharmaceutical company. Why is this kind of analysis or empirical assessment important from a business perspective? After that, I will discuss methodology um, and provide an overview of methodologies behind motivated intruder tests and what are the main factors that need to be taken into account when you do these types of empirical evaluations. And after that, Nathan Good will disclose, uh, will discuss his experiences conducting motivated intruder tests, how they actually work, and give some advice on how to protect your data when you depersonalize them. He's the guy who knows how to attack data, so I'm sure this will be very beneficial advice. Um, while we have a bias towards health data, at least for some of us, we'll try to keep the key points uh, domain agnostic, as the learnings we think are broadly applicable across different uh, areas. So with that, I'll pass it on to Janice, who will then discuss her perspective on motiv motivated through the test. Thanks, Khaled. Uh, so hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's good. Okay, thank you. All right, so just to uh, start and really set the context um, and explain why a motivated intruder attack was relevant uh, for Novartis. Um, we, uh, as a pharma company, a global pharma company, we're really in an evolving era of data sharing. Uh, and there's two pillars to this. There's sharing of clinical trial data. You'll see that mentioned in the first pillar. We do that under what we call voluntary data sharing. And uh, this was set up after the pharma FPA principles quite some years ago. And here we're really sharing uh, anonymized data sets uh, and supporting documentation from phase two and phase three clinical trials. These are all shared uh, with uh, researchers who put forward uh, um, analysis proposals and they, they sign uh, agreements in terms of use. Uh, and this is all implemented in a secure uh, uh, portal uh, called clinicalstudydatarequest.com. Uh, the data are shared uh, after uh, submission uh, and approval from major uh, health authorities. The second pillar then came about after the EMA policy 0070 or the clinical data publication policy and then it was followed by Health Canada where really uh, this is around sharing uh, anonymized uh, documents, CSRs, uh, clinical study reports and clinical submission documents. This happens after, uh, in the case of the EMA, after the CHMP opinion, whether it's positive or negative, uh, or indeed even if a sponsor withdraws an application. Uh, it is also uh, with public sharing, so people can register on the portal uh, and uh, are granted access uh, with uh, valid EU addresses and so on for the EMA. So hopefully that sense the context and uh, we as a company are trying to put together a framework that covers these uh, two elements of sharing information and data sharing. We want to have a standard approach um, and really uh, the, the main goal and high priority is that patient privacy is maintained. So the EMA uh, uh, under the clinical data publication policy and Health Canada are requiring public uh, sharing of clinical trial reports and they have provided us with guidance for um, elements around quantitative anonymization of these reports and how to do that. Uh, previously, prior to uh, these policies being in place, uh, most of our information sharing was done according to access to documents, which is the policy 0043. Uh, and in general, um, Novartis and most other companies, uh, they, what we did or do is uh, redaction. So this is really blacking out of information uh, thought to uh, make it possible to identify patients. 
So there's two things changing here that are quite important for us. Uh, the first one is changing from this redaction or blacking out of information and documents to actual anonymization. And the second thing is changing is that it's not sharing in a restricted environment, so to speak, but it's actually making these documents uh, available more publicly. So uh, the focus uh, is really on risk-based anonymization, where we take into account uh, the context of the data sharing and then assessing the risk of re-identification. And we want to ensure that the probability of re-identification of any particular patient, that we can compute that uh, during the anonymization process and ensure that it's below uh, a certain threshold that has been predefined. Now, re-identification calculations are based on statistical models and there's uh, assumptions around these statistical models and perhaps uh, we tend to be conservative, which could end up that actually the risk assessment or the true re-identification risk may be being underestimated. So that's really why we wanted to investigate this route of doing a motivated intruder attack uh, so that we could gain more confidence in the anonymization approach uh, and also how we calculate the probability to be able to re-identify someone. Uh, for us as a company, this was needed uh, for internal decision making, uh, but also to help us uh, in how we implement the policies uh, while we ensure data privacy. And I think it's important to say that uh, motivated intruder attack, it can be useful beyond uh, clinical trial data uh, and also just anonymized data, but uh, also uh, synthetic data. So we really have three expected goals uh, from the motivated intruder attack. Uh, the first one was to uh, update our understanding of the risks uh, in uh, uh, the real, uh, real risks in some uh, data recipient environments. The second one is to help us uh, improve uh, and gain additional data points to be able to improve maybe our anonymization practices. And the last one was really to help us adjust assumptions that may be made as we calculate uh, the risk of re-identification. And with that, I hand back to Khaled. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Janice. Um, so now, I, in this section, I'll, um, I'll present uh, some of the key methodological considerations when performing these motivated intruder tests. Um, and um, these, uh, uh, this next set of slides um, is informed by the various products that I've been involved in um, and also by analyzing the, uh, the academic literature. Um, it should be clear that the motivated intruder test is complementary to a statistical approach, uh, and together they provide a, a pretty good assessment of identity disclosure risk. Uh, but even then, um, motivated intruder attacks have limitations, which, which I will discuss as well. Um, the methodological points that I will discuss here should also be considered as important elements of a governance process for managing secondary data uses and disclosure. So it's not just a set of technical issues, there are a bunch of um, uh, governance considerations that um, um, are relevant here. So there's been, there's been a long history of performing motivated intruder tests or motivated intruder attacks, uh, mostly in the uh, academic settings where the analyst takes a data set that was uh, depersonalized in some way by someone else, and then they attack it. Um, we did a systematic review of these studies, and that was published in 2011. I haven't seen any updates by anyone else since then, but there have been a few more studies published uh, over the last nine years. Uh, these types of studies get a lot of media attention, which tends to skew the public discourse on this topic. We'll get back to that later. Um, in any case, there are at least three criteria that should be used to evaluate published motivator intruder tests. Uh, the first is whether the data set in question is properly depersonalized. In many cases, the studies reveal poor practices um, or data that were not uh, uh, depersonalized appropriately. Um, for example, data was only pseudonymized, was not anonymized properly. Uh, that's a common uh, common situation. Uh, While well, this kind of um, motivated intruder test is, is informative on pseudonymous data, it does not really help us understand whether good uh, whether good 
uh, depersonalization practices are and which practices work and which practices don't. The second criterion is whether the motivated intruder test was actually attempted uh, to match records with real people or was uh, whether it was only a statistical estimate of the likelihood of matching records with people. In many cases, the studies that were published that are claimed to be motivated intruder tests, they were really only statistical estimates and there was no attempt to match with, uh, with real individuals. Um, so these can be uh, very conservative um, and don't reflect the true risk. Um, this sometimes makes for a better media story, uh, but of course there's a strong caveat here uh, if, you're on, if you're not actually matching the records with real people. A real motivated intruder test attempts to match the records in the data set with, with people and then evaluate how successful that match was. Um, and then finally, in the case of statistical estimates, which, which are quite common in this literature, uh, a key distinction is whether the estimate um, is the match rate for the data set itself or for the population. This is the distinction between sample risk and population risk. Uh, the correct answer is population risk. If you estimate sample risk, the results are always going to be very highly inflated and they are simply incorrect or, or rather they're misleading. So many of the published studies estimate sample risk. So basically, if you look at the literature, they were done on data sets that were not depersonalized adequately and therefore uh, it was easier to uh, uh, find high risks. Uh, many of them did not match the records with real people. There were estimates, and these estimates were done uh, of, of sample risks, which tends to, to be uh, overinflated. Um, so you just have to be very careful when interpreting or, or uh, applying a lot of this literature to see uh, what exactly it's doing and what it's saying and how to uh, apply the results. Okay. So uh, there are some principles that are important for uh, motivated intruder tests. Um, the first one is that it's important to gather data on the effort and cost. Um, even if the records can be matched to individuals, um, this matching loses severity as the effort and cost to achieve the match increase. Regulations generally consider identifiability to be a risk if it is reasonably likely, and I'm emphasizing reasonably likely. And therefore, the reasonableness criterion is an important one. If the effort and cost to match a record to a person is very high, then arguably that record is not reasonably likely to be identifiable. Or put another way, if an adversary spends an, an inordinate amount of time and money, then the chances of matching a record to a real person can be quite high, but is that really likely to happen? When performing a motivated intruder test, it's also important to follow a code of conduct to ensure the in integrity of the process. So the first requirement in this code of conduct is to behave ethically. Um, this means that the analyst cannot, for example, lie or misrepresent themselves to gather information or trick potential matches or their acquaintances. For example, an analyst should not misrepresent themselves as a patient to access a patient support discussion group on Facebook and gather information from the individuals there in their attempt to, to re-identify or, or attack the data sets or use social engineering methods to get information over the phone. Um, and this has been done in the past and, and I think that crosses the line. Um, while some people may argue that this is limiting, it also ensures that the data controller does not cross ethical lines when assessing the privacy enhancing techniques. Um, the second requirement is an obvious one, but let's, let's just walk through this. Uh, no criminal uh, behavior. Uh, for example, the analyst should not break into people's houses or, or accounts to gather information. Um, some activities are either uh, ethically questionable or criminal. For example, going to the dark web and using stolen data that is being offered for sale there as a source of information to identify individuals in a data set. So that's certainly questionable behavior. And this is not hypothetical. A pair of Harvard students just um, did a, a study exactly like that recently. Uh, they haven't published yet. I don't know if a study like that is publishable, uh, but they certainly managed to get a lot of uh, media attention to that study. Um, so again, you have to be careful. Um, the third key requirement is to inform the data controller if the uh, motivated intruder test was performed without their knowledge. Uh, this is similar to the principles that should be applied if someone finds a security bug in software you have to inform the vendor and give them sufficient time to fix the problem before publicizing it. Uh, informing the data controller should be done before publishing a paper, for example, and certainly before telling the media. This gives the data controller an opportunity to limit the privacy risks to the data subjects. Um, 
And then one question that does come up is whether the analyst should attempt to contact the suspected match individuals to verify a match or to, or to gather additional information, or if they uh, should contact their acquaintances or their relatives or their employers, etc., as part of a motivated intruder attack. Um, some motivated intruder attacks that were conducted by reporters did exactly that because they wanted to have a face to the story. So they contacted individuals that were uh, matched to the data and interviewed them and put their names in, the, in their piece. So I'll leave that as a question for now, whether it's appropriate to uh, contact individuals uh, during a motivated intruder uh, at, attack or not. But it comes under the umbrella of having in place an appropriate code of conduct for doing these kinds of analyses. Okay, so the process um, has uh, four general steps. I'll go through each one of them briefly just to give you a sense of how this works and just highlight a couple of things along the way. Um, the process, uh, the steps are planning, matching, evaluation, and uh, reporting. Um, and the, the overall process involves trying to find external information that can be um, coupled with the depersonalized data such that the combined information can be reliably attributed or matched to a real person in the population. And part of the trick here is to get hold of as much of this external information as possible to increase the chances of a uh, successful match. So in the context of planning, um, it's generally better to perform a motivated intruder test if the data set is going to be released publicly. These types of data sets tend to be a higher risk. At least the process should be conducted once to assess the robustness of the depersonalization methodology. For non-public data sets, a motivated intruder test is also a good idea or a good tool to get confidence in the methodology that is used to protect the data against identity disclosure. Uh, with respect to when a motivated intruder test should be conducted, um, it is always better to uh, do that before a data set is disclosed or used. Sometimes it's not feasible, and so sometimes you do this after a data set has been disclosed, but at least you get feedback and incorporate it in, in, in the context of a continuous improvement cycle. Irrespective of where the organization lands on these two initial questions, the decision or criteria to, uh, or criteria to make a decision should be documented and clear so there's no uncertainty um, about when and how often to do these uh, tests. Ideally, a motivated intruder test um, should be conducted by a third party who, who was not involved in the depersonalization of the data or involved in applying the privacy enhancing technology that was used to, to protect the data. Uh, there will be an obvious conflict of interest um, and the findings would lack credibility if the entity that depersonalized the data also conducted the motivated intruder test. When planning a motivated intruder test, uh, a decision needs to be made about whether external commercial databases will be acquired as part of the exercise. Some of these databases can be expensive, although the cost is going down um, over time. There's so much data out there that the, the value of the, of the raw data is, is decreasing over time. In practice, it's a good idea to put a cap, though, on the total cost for, for um, a motivated intruder test and let the analysts decide by themselves whether specific commercial databases would be useful or would be needed. A meaningful motivated intruder test must be conducted by an analyst or a team of analysts who understand data and who can program. Otherwise, it's not really realistic. Um, the search through large amounts of information available online and to link the various data sources that will be found requires these skills. I would say these are critical skills for this kind of attack. Another key question that the data controller needs to answer is whether they have the authority to identify individuals in depersonalized data or to commission or have someone else do it for them. Doing so may not be permissible in some jurisdictions or maybe a breach of contract depending on the contracts that are in place. So if this is an issue, one solution is to uh, stop at suspected matches and not attempt to verify the matches. So with a suspected match, you don't confirm that a match is correct, uh, but you can um, uh, estimate it. We'll talk about that later. Uh, it's also uh, important, in my opinion, that motivated intruder tests go through an independent ethics review before they are conducted. Like any research on human subjects or their data, an ethics review is necessary. Um, it seems that many of the published motivated intruder tests in the literature um, do not go through this uh, independent ethics review, or at least this is not mentioned in the published articles, and I think this is a problem. It has resulted in a number of questionable practices and questionable methods for disseminating the results. So if this is not managed carefully, these kinds of studies can cause harm. 
For example, in one case, a professor claimed to have successfully identified the records of his students in an anonymized database. While the students may have agreed, there are some serious questions about coercion here um, when, uh, when the professor asks his students to participate in a, in a motivated intruder attack on, uh, on data sets that includes them. So you should always get an ethics review. Now we move on to the uh, next step in the uh, process matching. A key step in, motivated, in a motivated intruder test um, is verification. So initially there are suspected matches between a record and an individual and this suspicion reflects the evidence that has been gathered thus far linking the two based on the information that's been collected. But unless there's a verification step uh, there's a high likelihood that the suspected match is incorrect. So based on a summary of the evidence from the literature, only about a quarter of suspected matches are found to be correct after verification. So only a quarter of the time when there's a, a suspected match between a depersonalized record and a real person uh, and an attempt to verify is done are these suspected matches found to be correct. So this is why it's important to verify because um, the suspected match is, is, is going to overestimate uh, the match rate. The number of reasons for this, uh, for example, data errors may explain why a match was incorrect or there may be temporal misalignment among the different sources of information. Or it may not be possible to verify if, uh, if people cannot be contacted. Verification of suspected matches can be achieved if the controller has the ground truth to confirm suspected matches or you can go and contact the individuals directly. If you're not able to verify directly by contacting individuals or you don't have the ground truth, it's possible to estimate the correct match after verification without doing the actual verification. So this is the recommended approach is instead of trying to attempt to verify matches, you would estimate the, uh, the, um, which matches can be verified and there are ways to do this. Um, and this addresses the authority issue um, and also um, saw some of the other issue, uh, problems uh, with contact individuals that I mentioned earlier on. This is an important uh, step because there can be a big gap between suspected matches and verified matches. Um, and then uh, as mentioned earlier, we want to put a cap on resources expended on the motivated intruder exercise. Um, the cap has to be large enough though uh, to offer a realistic picture of what a true adversary would spend uh, on average uh, as part of a real attack. Um, so when matching records to real people, there are four levels of matching that can be uh, considered. The first is the analyst can try to identify themselves in the data, if that makes sense, if the data uh, could potentially cover them, or they can uh, secondly um, try to identify someone they know. Um, in general, identifying yourself in the data is easier. Uh, the second easier thing to do is uh, identifying people you know, acquaintances and family. Um, the next level is you can the analyst identify someone using public information. Um, and the fourth level is can the analyst identify someone by combining multiple sources of information, including public and commercial uh, data. So typically you'd go through these four levels as part of the motivator and true to test. Um, even if there's a link between a record and a real person, the next question is whether something new will be learned about the person from the uh, depersonalized data. This speaks to the level of potential harm and the severity of an identity disclosure. And this is important because sometimes to identify a record, um, you, uh, you use all the information in the record and therefore you don't learn something new. Um, and if you don't learn something new, then the potential for harm is very, very small. So that's a factor that needs to be considered as well in assessing the potential harm from motivated and true to test. Um, so there are different types of attacks that can be conducted on a data set. Um, for example, you can start off with a famous person and then, uh, or, or an acquaintance, someone you know, um, and then uh, search the data to find some, uh, to find a record that can potentially match that famous person or that acquaintance, or you can start from the data itself, it's, uh, data set itself and uh, try to match against external databases such as a voter registration list to see if you can um, link the records to real people. In practice, the, um, both directions of attack are used. You, you try to match against acquaintances and famous people and you try to match um, the data against uh, registries or, or other types of databases. That's typically how the process uh, uh, progresses. Um, and um, the, the two directions of attack are intermingled basically um, throughout, throughout the, uh, the process. 
In terms of evaluation, so typically the evaluation is done in terms of the match rate and the effort, so uh, effort and cost, so the resources expended. So this is an example of a budget that's used for planning um, a motivated intruder test and for uh, uh, calculating the, the uh, resources expended, um, which will include uh, the, the effort for the different types of attack, uh, any commercial databases that are acquired, and any other uh, custom programming that's, that's used. Um, this is really uh, important um, because, again, as I mentioned, the, the resources needed for a motivated intruder test is, a, is an important measure of the likelihood of this being uh, um, performed in, in practice and performed at, uh, at scale. Um, and then the second uh, key uh, metric is, of course, the match rate. As I mentioned before, uh, you can just look at suspected matches, use that information to estimate the verified matches, and use the estimated verified matches as your, as your uh, match rate. And then finally, reporting. This is a template for the, uh, for the reports that uh, are produced from these types of motivated intruder tests, um, which describe the methodology and the results. And as I mentioned, the, we published a paper recently which describes a lot of these details. So you can see an example of, of what an outcome of this type of attack um, looks like. Um, and in that particular study, the, the average um, effort to, uh, uh, for a suspected match that, uh, for a suspected match was 24 hours of effort. Um, and so that gives you a sense of, of uh, at least for a clinical trial document, how much effort it takes. And these were all US patients. Um, and then the, the match rate was, was um, uh, there were no estimated verifications were very low in that particular case. So, uh, so the match rate effectively was, was uh, uh, zero. Okay, so that's the process um, and key methodological issues that need to be considered as you perform motivated intruder tests or you are commissioning someone or hiring someone to do a motivated intruder test um, on data sets that you have depersonalized. Um, and uh, if you're not uh, doing that, but you're reading about it, then hopefully this gives you an idea of what criteria to use to evaluate published motivated intruder tests as well to see how well they were conducted and how to interpret the results. And with that, I'll pass it on to Nathan, who will then uh, discuss uh, practical experiences doing this. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's good. Perfect. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Um, so I'm uh, Nathan Good. I'm principal and CEO at Good Research. And as Khaled mentioned, um, we, we do motivated intruder attacks. Um, the bulk of what we do is trying to provide a lot of tooling to help in the privacy space. So we are a motley crew of software engineers, data scientists, user researchers, privacy people, technology ethics people who have put together a, a group of tooling to a, a set of tools to help people with um, privacy issues. So motivated intruder is one of those looking at apps and looking at websites and data flows. And we have a set of tools for helping with this. So today, and we'll be talking specifically about the work we do in the motivated intruder test and how that, um, how that work is conducted and what our approach is to, to doing that. So in uh, performing a motivated intruder attack, one of the things that we have to consider is all the types of information that we're going to use. As Khaled said earlier, the main goal of a motivated intruder attack is identifying an individual. So you're effectively, from the perspective of a security person, you're pen testing your data. You're trying to understand, is this data protected robustly enough that I can protect against a motivated attacker within certain limits and within a certain scope who wants to identify a, a certain individual. So one of the ways that we go about this is we look at lots of different sources of information and combine this information in various different ways to try to identify people from the data set. And so this is a list of the types of information we generally use, especially um, in reference to this report, but um, I'll really be going through these in a little bit more detail. So first of all, let's look at what we mean by contextual data. 
And contextual data is basically the set of metadata that exist in various different forms that can be used to identify people. So examples that we have are clinical records, hospital discharge records, death records, um, data analysis on the initial data set. There's all different types of metadata. And what we try to do is take this metadata and use it to match against what we have in the database. So similar to like what Khaled was saying earlier, if you can look at different attributes of, of behaviors, or you can look at different attributes of ways that a person may have, like if you're looking to identify a person inside of a hospital, you can look at hospital discarded records. If you're looking at um, who got assigned certain medications, you can look at certain clinical reports. Um, if you're looking at somebody who um, recently was deceased, you can reach at death records. So depending on the types of behavior tra you're trying to identify, there's a lot of metadata or reports or external information that relates to that behavior. So this, this data can be very, very helpful. Um, some of that data is very aggregated, so you have to make some inferences there as well. Um, one of the problems with this data is, even though it can be very accurate, is that it can be a lot of time to find, and in some cases you have to pay for it, some cases it can have be um, more difficult to, to access it. Um, and then in a lot of cases, you actually would benefit a lot from having a tremendous amount of domain knowledge. Um, and that's not always the case in the uh, motivated intruder attack. Uh, next is social media. Um, so as Khaled was saying earlier, you have, you know, one of the ways that you could start these investigations is by looking for famous people. And today with social media, social media allows anyone to be famous or try really, really hard to do so. And consequently, people have a large public footprint of things that they like, things that they do, things that they're interested in through the various different types of social media. And so by combing social media for specific types of information related to your target, you can use that information in some cases to, to greatly enhance the uh, effectiveness of your attack. Um, social media also has the benefit of being a low barrier of entry. So anyone, if, if the profile is public, anyone can kind of go in and, and look at this information and, and grab it. You can also um, has the benefit of not being a very proprietary source of data in the sense that because it's open and because it's well known, you can write tools to it that you can reuse over and over again. Whereas if in the previous case, if you're finding a very specific type of database or a very specific type of information, you'll, you'll have to invest in a tool that maybe you'll use only once. Um, in this case, with social media, there's lots of tools that you could use to gather this information and put it in a way that you can reuse it. Um, some of the cons in this space are definitely, it's, um, there's a lot out there. And so there's a lot of information you'd have to sift to through in order to really get at the information you want. Um, and, and this may come a surprise, but not all that's true. And so you have to be very, um, very cognizant of the fact that a lot of this information could be unreliable. Um, it could not be as accurate as you'd want in order to establish that level of confidence that you'd need in order to, to use this as a strong the strong basis for making inferences. So social media is a way to sort of enhance data sets and combine with other methods, but it's it's not always the 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 best way. Uh, the next way is looking at what we call the general population data sets. And so examples of those would be, so for example, a voter registry list where you have um, a list of maybe you have names and maybe you have addresses and maybe you have dates of birth even. Um, you have almost a ground truth data set that establishes some degree of credibility from a credible source. Um, and the nice thing about these types of data sets is that they're typically curated, they're typically um, high quality, and they can be used to, um, to really establish a firm basis for your attack. 
And so you can use them as ground truth. You can use them to look at the um, database and search through it for very specific things and specific uh, patterns. Um, the difficulty in this is that it can be very expensive. So buying high quality data is not, is not cheap. And to Khaled's point earlier of really budgeting out a realistic attack scenario, it could be the case that the cost would be prohibitive for an attacker to gain the high quality information they need in order to make the right inferences. And so in some cases, it just may be cost prohibitive to use this type of data set. Another way of getting information, especially in certain industries like, um, you know, if you're looking at government industries, um, government support industries like finance or uh, healthcare, um, there's typically government agencies that maintain a um, list of information and you can file an access or request for information from, um, from the US government. And if this information is really great. Um, you can get things like clinical reports, hospital discharge records, death records, things of this nature in some cases. Um, and you can repeat this process. In many cases, it's not very expensive for small amounts of information. Um, the problem is it can take a long time. So in some cases, it can take months, some cases even longer. And in another case, it can, um, you can get you know, a lot of information back, but it's, it, it could be in a format that you can't easily process. And so you would have to take that information, repurpose it, um, and then use that for analysis. So depending on the time frame of the motivated intruder attack, a FOIA may or may not be a, um, a good way of um, enhancing your um, data set. Another way that we, we've considered, um, especially in the medical space, is um, using recruiters. Um, recruiters already have panels of users that have very specific attributes as associated with them. And um, what's kind of nice is you could use these recruiters as a method of getting sets of data that, that you could combine with other information that we've mentioned earlier, like a voter registration list or hospital discharge list or other types of information. And so by using, looking at a recruiter data set or access or you know, hiring recruiter, you can get very targeted information that's usually a very high quality. Um, this isn't always possible, which is one of the cons associated with this. And it's also prohibitively expensive in many cases. So depending really on the risk profile of the data that you're attempting to anonymize or the, um, or the information that you really need to protect and the value of that, this is typically a very expensive approach to doing it. So, um, let's see. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so, how does this all work together? So, one way that you can think about this is all of these different sources of information combine to form a motivated intruder attack. So, for example, we could obtain a list of a population by zip code. And then we could find a subset of that target data set that lives in that zip code with the different types of information associated with it. Then we could return, obtain a voter registry list for those zip codes and then look at unique combinations of quasi identifiers. Then we could find social media accounts of people who live around those zip codes. And, and we really kind of use this back and forth way that Colette mentioned earlier of getting information from one source and applying that information to a different source and then using that to really narrow it down and, um, and explore different options. So you're kind of expanding the scope of your operation and then you're contracting it, trying to find some matches, assessing the probability or likelihood of those, maybe comparing those against some ground truths and then expanding it back out again. So it's using all of those different techniques that we talked earlier, we're really kind of opening up and then narrowing down different sets of possibilities. Um, so what are some of the best practices in depersonalization of data sets that we've learned? So we're, we're not in the business of depersonalizing data, but based off of what we've been doing, 
um, we have a couple of recommendations that are very, very um, important and it would make our life a lot harder if people were to follow these more aggressively. Um, one is that, as Colette had mentioned earlier in his talk, is that not all anonymization is, our depersonalization is equal. Um, there isn't a one size fits all, and these different techniques, um, if you don't use them properly, can actually um, enhance your risk rather than reduce it. And one of the practices that we see a lot in this case is really the use of identifiers, is that um, a lot of people will strip out what they think are um, identifiers like name and address, but they'll leave in a lot of context and they'll leave in a lot of metadata that can be um, very, very useful and identify a person and they'll just call it a day. So it needs to be really well thought out and it needs to be less, um, at least to be a little bit more sophisticated than just stripping away name and address and things of this nature. Um, and one of the more sophisticated ways of doing this is really thinking about how you aggregate your data. And so if you're going to be removing specific identifiers and there's a lot of metadata that could possibly be used to infer this information for this individual, aggregating those buckets makes it a lot, aggregating that information into buckets makes it a lot harder to do. And you have to really sort of think through your aggregation strategy, but that definitely um, by doing that makes it a lot harder. Uh, the other thing is outliers, it, when we run attacks, outliers are incredibly useful. So try to find outliers in your data set and, and make sure that they're aggregated properly, for example, is one way of, of doing that. So if you have an outlier that has really unique traits, that person is definitely going to stand out. And so making sure that those outliers in your anonymized data set are aggregated properly so they don't appear to be um, outliers um, and don't aren't as easily readily identifiable. Um, the other thing is really removing a lot of dates. Uh, date information and time information is really helpful when we run these attacks because we're able to constrain events to specific timeframes and then with timeframes we can get richer and more credible sources of data. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, look for, we have uh, the website motivateintruder.com Feel free to go there for more information. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, if you're looking to run these, we're we're happy to talk more. Thank you. Excellent. Thank thank you very much, Nathan. Um, so uh, now we will uh, uh, take questions. So if you have any questions, can you please uh, start typing them on in the chat box? Um, in the meantime, I'll just give you some logistical updates very quickly. Um, first is we'll send you the material from this webinar, and we, we do organize monthly webinars on privacy topics and privacy and ethics technologies. So uh, we'll send you more information about those as well over time as we organize them. And we also have um, information about those on our web, web page um, uh, with, a, with an event list, uh, upcoming events list. Um, and we're, we're also uh, uh, putting out some material, again, on the same types of topics as uh, online tutorials and courses, uh, which will be on our website. And I'll send you links to those uh, when, when they're posted. Um, so here are the contacts for the three of us. If you have any um, questions, you can send, send us an email, uh, and you'll get copies of the slide deck with, um, um, with these email addresses on them as well, uh, either later on today or tomorrow. So now let's go to uh, questions. And um, let me start off by uh, asking both uh, Janice and Nathan about their um, views on how often, uh, well, for Nathan, how often these motivated intruder tests or attacks are pre being performed today. Is the number increasing? Who does them? And for Janice, whether uh, this is something that Novartis sees as being uh, uh, something that will be done on a regular basis and whether the remainder of the pharma industry should be doing these types of uh, motivator and true tests. So let's start with, with Nathan and then, and then uh, to Janice. Uh, sure. So I think um, in, in terms of 
frequency, I think definitely people should be running these um, every time they have high risk information and they're, they're concerned about the anonymization strategy. I mean, certainly we've been getting a lot of requests from places in finance, for example, who, um, who have a lot of this information. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I, I don't think they're as popular as, as say other methods that people are thinking of right now. It's not something that people are very familiar with. And so I, I think it would be great if people did them more. Janice, from your perspective? Yes, so um, we we did the uh, one motivated intruder attack and the intention was then uh, to actually do another one in a more specialized population, like say a, a trial from a pediatric or uh, rare disease indication. Um, that was the intention, but uh, actually with the EMA, uh, and, and Brexit, there was a delay really on uh, implementation of the clinical data publication. Um, but as we would pick that up again, uh, we would then also pick up our plans to do a further um, motivated intruder attack. Uh, how regularly we would do it, I'm not sure. Uh, um, that will remain to be seen. Okay, thank you. So here we have a question. Um, let's assume a company has an aggregated data set and the company believes it is aggregated enough to be considered anonymous. This data set is to be provided to a customer under a contract. Where do you start and where do you stop validating if this set is really anonymous? Sure. Um, yeah, I can, I can tackle that. Um, I think um, it's a it's an excellent question because you can. I mean, if it's under contract, you're likely going to have time constraints, anyways, and so you can run a motivated intruder attack. I mean, it wouldn't be ideal, but you can do it in three weeks, two to three weeks. Um, I mean, those are certainly time frames that we're very familiar with, and I think. Um, you know, in that time frame, what you would want to do is think about what are your most val what would be the worst case scenario for you in, in that situation and prioritize those kind of attacks. So, for example, if the worst case scenario, I'm just going to make something up, would be identifying a um, an individual who has performed a certain type of behavior, um, then really have the attack focus on that scenario and make sure that you're um, that you're really um, addressing that when you're doing your attack and you can focus your your data sources and the types of anonymization and the ground truths and everything around that specific scenario um, and then also i think it's really important to understand the risk profile of the company and the um, the sensitive material that you would that you really want to want to get out that could be contained in that data set um, and you know basically prioritize your attacks based off of that okay great thank you um, so the uh, next question um, can you recommend any literature online or online summary on the methodology um, and a framework for motivated intruder attacks. So I'll send a link to the paper that we published, and from there you can get a lot of references. Uh, and there's, a, I think, a, a pretty decent methodology section in there as well that describes um, the, the overall technique in a bit more detail than what I presented. Um, another question, how did you obtain U.S. discharge, hospital discharge records? Aren't they anonymized? If so, how useful are they for a reidentification attack? So uh, I think I'll, I'll just say a couple of things on that and I'll pass it on to Nathan because you, you, you use them as well. Um, the hospital discharge data are available um, from a number of different states um, and from, from uh, uh, ARC as well, um, which, which makes them available across multiple states together. Um, That's AHRQ. Um, they're supposed to be the identified data and uh, so they don't have any uh, actual names of patients, um, but hospital discharge data can be uh, one step in the process. 
So you can have hospital discharge data and then link that with, um, I mean, a, a simple example with newspaper articles uh, describing, uh, you know, accidents or domestic disturbance stories which result in hospitalization. Um, so you can use it as one part of, of, of the mosaic of data sets that you can put together um, that helps you add more details to the records. And this is where they become useful, even though they themselves are not identifiable. And Nathan, also, do you have any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that's about right. And also, I think you made this point earlier that um, that they're not all equal. There's not like a standard way that people are doing this. And so some have more information than others. That makes it easier to have that linkage. Yeah. Um, so, uh, another question, if you did a motivated intruder test today, and then you repeat it again in another year, would you get different results? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I really like that one a lot because um, there's certain elements of what you can do that you can repeat. Um, and certainly, like we have tools that that look for repeatable things. Um, but in some cases, that that's not the case. Um, it, it can be contextual. And so it really just depends on your data set. So for example, if you're looking at location privacy, say for example, in a geo-coded data set, there's um, certain things, you know, if you think of that as a, like a graph model, you can use you know, graph theory and graph modeling to really have some fundamental insights on how that leakages can kind of occur. And so you can interpret things in that way. And then also, if you know enough about the data set, and the, so for example, if it's using certain anonymization strategies, um, for example, in, in finance or in healthcare, and some of those strategies are very similar. And so some of that's very repeatable. Um, but then the context of that can change over time. And so I think it's a little bit of both. And the percentage of how much of it is repeatable versus how much um, is not is a little it really kind of depends on that data set. But, um, and also the the risk profile can change as well. And since we're trying to prioritize for risks, it could be the case that in a year, the risk of re-identifying the individual is, is vastly different than um, in when you started it um, for, for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, assuming that those things remain kind of constant, there's definitely a degree of repeatability in some cases. Excellent. Well, I think we're out of time. These are really, really good questions. Thank you very much for, for the folks who asked the questions. And, um, and thank you, Janice and Nathan, for taking the time today. Um, I really appreciate you, uh, uh, you preparing these presentations and sharing your knowledge. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we'll send you the materials and the recordings in, in the next little while, and uh, we'll keep you up to date on other activities, other events that we're organizing. And uh, yeah, please stay, uh, stay safe out there and hopefully you can join us uh, uh, at some other event in the, in the next few weeks. Thank you and everyone and have a great day.